I'm Rob Lacuri, a senior editor at Gold Derby, here with Star Trek Strange New World star Anson Mount. Anson, in your social media recently, you announced that production on season three has wrapped and yeah. you thanked lifelong Star Trek fans and you said, I am one of you. It's because of you that I get to live out my dreams like this. Talk me through what this show means to you and what you meant. Well, I, I have to I have to out you first. We were just before you introduced me, we were having a very much nerdier conversation. Um and uh you were saying that you sort of like when you're interviewing Star Trek folks, you flash back to your your childhood. And I was saying I I get to go back to my childhood by doing this job, which is an amazing feeling, an amazing way to walk into work every day. Uh my mom introduced me to the original series when it was in syndication on our local UHF channel, uh, Sunday nights at six o'clock and when I was seven or eight and, um, quickly got me hooked. And then, um, kept watching. I watched all of the original, probably every episode I've probably seen at least three times. And then the, um, next generation started airing. I want to say it was like freshman or sophomore year of high school. And then I hit college and I didn't watch TV for a decade, basically. Um, cause when, even once I got out of school, I, you know, who can afford a TV and then who could yeah. afford cable. Right. Um, but when I found out that, um, you know, I was coming to the end of hell on wheels and I was sort of having meetings and Julie McNamara, who is, who is heading up this, uh, CBS all access launch. If you remember that at the time. Yeah. Uh, she she let me in on the fact that they were going to be doing a Trek show, and I I called my representatives from the parking lot, and I said, "Get me on this show." Um, and then they went and hired Jason Isaacs. <laughs> <laughs> that Jason. was discovered. That was this. Well, you know what? I to be honest, like well played. Uh, he was he was much better in that role than I could ever could have been. And, um, and I'm a fan of his, I was then I am now. And, um, but thank God, because then they called me up the next year and said, we, Hey, we have this other captain, captain Pike. Would you be interested in, or no, they actually didn't tell me it was Pat captain Pike. They said it was a captain Parker or something like that. And, uh, it wasn't until after I signed on that they told me it was captain Pike and I knew exactly what that meant. Yeah, that's. I mean, Jason Isaac's amazing as Lorca. And if that didn't happen, then we wouldn't be here talking about you on Strange New Worlds. Um, your version of Pike was obviously, for people who don't remember, was introduced during Discovery's second season in the season premiere um, back in 2019. But And it was so successful. I remember I, this. I'm part of this whole thing as a fan. I remember thinking this is phenomenal. The fans got behind it. There was a groundswell of support. I was one of them signing the petition and oh, then you finally Thank got you. the show what can you can you take me back to that period of your life when that was all happening and and then it finally got announced and you were told obviously that you're getting your own show well um you know i i have to go back first of all thank you uh you you have changed my life uh as well as everybody who demanded the show um but when I went into to play Pike, uh, what they had not told me is that when when Alex Kurtzman had called up Akiva Goldsman and asked him to be a writer on on Discovery, uh, he all he told him was that it was a it was a Star Trek prequel, so Akiva assumed it was a Pike show. And when he showed up in the writers' room and they started talking about Discovery this, Discovery that, he was like, "What? Where? Who?" <laughs> he was like, no, this is no, <laughs> we have to do a Pike show. So just as a way of sort of feeling that out, they had written a Pike character and I got cast and um, they started talking about it more uh, and they didn't tell me, thank goodness. Uh, then um, it was still just an idea that was floating around and um, they were doing these short treks at the time and they sort of threw these short treks at us and wanted to do all these short treks with us. And I, and then I, I kind of, I called Alex and I said, I, and a couple of them I was in sort of just to be there, I felt. And I called Alex and I said, I, Hey, I'm not really sure about like, what, what are we doing here? Like what, uh, if we're setting this up and we're going to be advertising this, the Anson's in this. And then I'm just sort of like, 
kind of walking yeah. through. Like, I don't, what are we doing? And he said, well, that's a good question. Let me call you back. And he called me back about two days later and he was like, hey, I think I got us a show. And uh, I was like, a what? He was like, a show, a new show, a TV show. I was like, okay. So what What he'd done, he and, he and Akiva had pitched a pilot or pitched an idea for this being a show and the um, network ordered a, a pilot script. And then uh, flash forward another uh, year, two, almost two years, uh, and they have uh, written the script. They're still talking about it. Um, we haven't yet quite gone into the pandemic yet, and uh, or maybe we have, and um, we still didn't have contracts, me or Ethan or Rebecca. And I was convinced it wasn't going to happen because I was like, they're just, they're dragging their feet. They're not serious about this and somebody's going to get a job. Um, and so eventually they did, they did come through and solidified um, our connection to the project. And, and then, yeah, we got, we got moving right. Yeah. Still in the middle of the pandemic. Yeah. I think it began in February, 2021 is when production yeah, started. Right. And then, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was I mean, we were all going through hell, but there was there was a couple of little glimmers of hope back then, uh, and that was something that we were so looking forward to. It finally premieres, really strong season one, terrific, and then season two comes along, and just completely blows us all away. Like it was so bold and ambitious, experimenting with various genres and storytelling formats. What were your thoughts when you? Uh, when you first discovered what season two would, would be, and then at the end, what, what it accomplished? Because it was really, really fantastic, wasn't it? Season two? Yeah. Um well, I mean, I I think I can I can say um for for the writers that that we we did feel a certain amount of of brevity because the the two episodes that I think were a little bit more out there and there maybe maybe caused a certain amount of questions about where are you going with this. Those episodes tended to really pop in season one. And so there was a sense of um okay, you guys know what you're doing. We'll leave you alone. And um and so, you know, Akiva and Henry being Akiva and Henry, they <laughs> took that as a mandate and um uh decided to see how far we could push some things and and we really this is also when we really realized that we were getting a lot of um we get get getting a lot of mileage out of having con conversations about genre and sort of what what makes us what would make us excited what worlds would make us excited because um, if these guys do one thing well, it's keeping us engaged as a cast. It it does not get mooring the show. Uh, I mean, I remember when we were when we were building up to doing and doing the musical episode in season two. That was the second to last episode of the season when traditionally people are at their most exhausted. You know, yeah. just get me out of here. And, uh, I remember have, you know, we had to, we had, first of all, we had to record the album during episode eight on the weekends and we had to do, you know, there's no time to do choreography other than after work or on the weekends. And I remember showing up for a choreography rehearsal, um, on a Sunday and looking around and realizing that everybody was super excited to be there. And just having a blast, and and I was like, "Wow, this we we got to keep doing this. We got to keep having a late season sort of curveball." Yeah, yes, you do. I think you absolutely do. And um, it's like lightning in a bottle when people are really pumped and engaged and exhausted, but it doesn't matter. I mean, God, you can really make something so magic. And Subspace Rhapsody is magical. I love how you really go for it here, Anson. Like, I love how in that, um, I think it's a uh, private conversation, The uh, really the first time we get to see 
um, pipe singing and you fall to your knees dramatically and then Lan flicks a switch. Uh, that It's just such a really, it's, I've seen the episode a few times now. Do you, how, do you, how do you get into the right mindset to feel so safe that you can swing for the fences in an episode like that as an actor? Uh, you grow to be 50 years old and stop giving much of a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true you know i always thought i thought um i always thought when people said this thing midlife crisis um because i was joking I, i've started like i've started getting more tattoos and like just sort of like Same. you know making you know decided doing the things i haven't done yet and i always thought when people were talking midlife crisis they, they meant oh uh it's a it's a man who's getting older that wants to feel young again. And so he gets the sports car to feel, no, that's not it. No. A midlife crisis is when you, you suddenly one day realize I'm statistically more than halfway through this roller coaster ride. <laughs> and that, you know, all, all of those, like one day I will things we've already said to ourselves, that is today. That's now. You know, there's no more putting it off. It's what's the point of putting it off? And that that goes with acting choices. That goes with are you gonna are you gonna go there or not? Um, and and thankfully, I've just gotten to a point in my life where um, I'm aware that there is you know nothing bad's gonna happen to you. What's you know what's the worst gonna happen? People laugh at you. Great, that's another <laughs> awesome action to have as an actor. You know, are you gonna lose your job or you know it's just, you know maybe um but there are other things i can do and there's no debtor's prison in the united states so um yeah that that's i when i but 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 speaking more technically about that means specific specifically that kind of stuff comes out of just i wanted to i wanted to be able to put them in the most uh vulnerable position possible for when the other shoe drops right yeah and i mean that's i think that's what really makes this character saw because and i get it like I, as a 46 year old man like oh, i'm at the point now where you get to that point of self-acceptance and you don't really care about what people think anymore you're comfortable and i think that's just the perfect thing for playing pike at this stage of his life and you play him really naturalistically if that's even a word which i really love i love your portrayal of making him like a living breathing guy he's not some apparition that we all just admire from a distance so that must be an intentional choice from you from the get-go right yeah i think that's important all the best leaders in my life from my scout master to the best teachers to showrunners to you know my my reps you know the the best leaders are those who are just straightforward and honest about their own vulnerabilities, their own humanness. Um, and uh, we've been experiencing that on this show. I got to say the leadership is, is quite good. Uh, they, we get a lot, you were talking earlier about, about, you know, <laughs> these crazy ideas we get for the show. And really a lot of that comes out of just Henry or Akiva casually wandering by while we're shooting. And we just end up in a, conversation about um our character or or something we want to do the, the musical came out of uh, us lobbying for that because we looked around and realized how many singers we have in the cast not yeah. me uh, <laughs> a lot of other people and i just happened to like oh shit situations uh so we really pushed for that and um and it, it wasn't hard to convince them they were they're really they like taking big swings clearly yeah big swings and uh and when they actually land and it's just complete magic for a show like this. Um, you, season two le uh, leaves us on a cliffhanger. Uh, number one is pleading with uh, Pike for orders. You're staring out at, I guess, a green screen at this point or the volume, and the, but it's the Gorn ship attacking. You turn around to a distressed crew and it cuts to black. <sighs> Mate, um, come on. Uh, what are we supposed to do with that? We are desperate to know what's going to happen in season three. You know, and you can't tell us, but can you yeah. at least... Give us an idea about how exciting season three will be for fans, given what we just went through uh, in season two. Yeah, um, I think it's 
I think it's not just a, a, an exciting season, but I think it's just storytelling wise, development wise, technically it's going to be our best season so far. Um, and a lot of that has to do with even bigger swings being taken. The musical episode <laughs> it will not be the craziest thing that we did. We have done by the end of this. Um, and just feeling more ownership over what it is that we're doing and realizing that it continues to resonate. I mean, you could we are, we're all pretty sure that we had something with season one, but you could have knocked us over with a feather when we saw the actual numbers, not the numbers, but, you know, because they won't show you numbers anymore. <laughs> but the, the, yeah. the response was incredible. Um, and that has continued. And it, it was an honor to get to go to the Critics' Choice Awards this year and um we did not expect that at all uh and and yeah it's like wow people are actually watching and enjoying what we're what we're doing so we're feeling even more emboldened wow i, I can't imagine what more we could possibly get but uh, i will trust you and we would have to be patient and just we'll just wait um final question is you know for certain sci-fi films and series particularly like trek it attracts and fosters the most devoted and very vocal fan base imaginable. And when you're in a show on in the Star Trek world, of course you have more of a link to what the fans are thinking and saying. Is that something that you had to get used to? You had a bit of it on Sons of Anking, but it's not really in the same league. When you are when you first joined the Trek family, what was that like when you realised the fans are really part of this as well? Well, I... I learned very, very early on in the theater to never read your reviews while you're in production. Uh, but these days that's, that's harder because everybody can be a published critic at the stroke of a thumb. Um, but I also learned a very important thing in a theater is to never believe your worst review and never believe your best review. Um, and that is, helped me through and i just for whatever reason i i have a thick skin i guess i i you know those of us who who grew up grew up uh with not the best childhoods tend to um and who train in the theater under crazy east europeans tend to develop a thick skin so um i i don't know i yeah, yeah i take it all in stride and um and really let my gut and and my colleagues and my friends be the real the people i really listen to yeah that's that's very healthy and i think uh it's probably the best bet and so mate thank you so much for your time today your insight into the into um season two and mate we i just love this show and um, i'm really grateful that it's on the air so whatever that means uh, and uh and thank you again for your time oh thanks man i really appreciate you and and all of your support 